Well, good morning, Severn. How are we all doing? Are we awake on this dreary day following all the Christmas hustle and bustle? I trust that you all enjoyed your Christmas this week. You know, whether you shared it with family, whether you shared it with friends, or maybe you just had quiet time all alone away from the hustle and bustle of this crazy life in the 21st century, I do hope that you are refreshed and you're ready to, uh, to close out this year in 2015 and, and welcome 2016, whatever it may bring. It's always a surprise and um, it certainly gives us something to hope for. We'll talk about that today. I also hope that you were here on, the, on Christmas Eve. It was a fantastic service. Pastor Ryan delivered a gospel-centered message as he does every week and I just know that there were lives that were, were changed as a result of that message that was preached. It was basically the icing on the cake to the four-week Advent series that he did leading up to Christmas Eve. I promise you, you will, you will enjoy it. If you're new to Severn, if, or if maybe you just missed one or two of those messages, I encourage you, go on the web at severn.cc. All of our messages are there. They're there in any form you want. They're there from video. If you want to watch whoever's preaching, if you want to hear it in audio, it's there. But download it. I encourage you to do so. It may be encouragement to you. But even more so, perhaps you could give it to someone as a gift. The gift that they didn't get under their Christmas present, but a gift that will transform their lives for eternity because the gospel was preached. Amen? I'm Mark Rossi. I'm one of the elders here at Severn Covenant Church. In case you're wondering where Pastor Ryan is, he is enjoying a well-deserved rest to prepare for the next series. But more importantly, and the real excuse, he's getting ready to have a baby. So uh, he's getting ready to welcome in the, the arrival of his daughter, Scarlett. And I know he keeps telling me, Man, that baby's going to come tonight. That baby's going to be here by Christmas Eve. I said, Ryan. Scarlet will come when Scarlet wants to come. And there's nothing you can do about it. Take it from me, I tried. I tried. When, uh, Olivia, when, when, uh, she was, when she was born, she was due, doctor said, December 25th. I said, wow, I'm going to have a Christmas baby. I didn't know it was Olivia at the time. We didn't know it was a girl or a boy. But at any rate, Christmas Day came. We had dinner. She prepared it like we always do. We had people over Christmas Eve. I mean, Christmas evening went by. No baby. Well, how can this be? The doctor said the 25th. Why aren't we on schedule here? And so I said, okay, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. The next day, the day when everybody rushes around trying to find, take back all the stuff that they really didn't need or want anyway, we decided to go out shopping. And my wife at the time, we were just... You know, only married a little over a year. She still had her little sporty <coughs> Nissan 240SX. If you knew anything about that little sporty car, it had no backseat, relatively no backseat. It was a two-door. Well, I took my mother-in-law. She got the front seat. I made Patty sit in the back seat. In and out of that back seat, climbing in there. I thought, that has to get things going, right? <laughs> we went to the mall. We went up and down the steps. No escalators, no elevators. Olivia came when Olivia wanted to come on the 29th of December. So happy birthday, dear. And Scarlett will do the same when she's good and well ready to enter this world. I think that if I were in that nice, cozy, warm environment, I think I'd want to stay longer too. It's scary out here. But today we're starting, as, as Aaron told you, a three-week series on hope. And my message today is entitled Hope for Your Life. And contrary to your Connect card, it's from 1 Peter chapter 1, not 1 Peter chapter 3. Little typo there. I'm not going to preach about how you ladies need to take all the bling you got for Christmas and give it away. <laughs> so let's turn to the scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 3. The Holy Word of God says, Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you 
who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you loved him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is hope anyway? Have you ever thought about that? We see this word used all the time. We use it frequently. I even used it when I said, I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope you came to the Christmas Eve service. You know, if we look at that English word in the dictionary, we find that it has two meanings. The first is the common use of the word. It's the way that we use it today in the 21st century. And it's defined as a feeling of expectation, a desire, or a wish that a certain thing is going to happen. It was my desire that all of you would be here Christmas Eve. It was my wish, but I know for a fact that that isn't the case. Many of you were not able to make it that night. Some of you were coming for the first time today, so you couldn't have been here, but it was still my wish. It was my desire. Some of us, some of us may still hope that the Ravens have a chance today against the Steelers, pull off a win, but given the fact that that NFL money machine has moved it from 8.30 in prime time down to 1 o'clock suggests that maybe there isn't too good of a chance that'll be a highlight of today's football games. Most of us Ravens fans are just hoping beyond hope that the season will be over so we don't have to go through the pain every Sunday of watching them fall apart with 18 people on the bench. So, the second meaning, and the meaning that you we'll find it in most dictionaries is preceded by a word. This word is called archaic. That means it's old. It's not used anymore. It's not used in common English today. But the archaic meaning of hope is trust, reliance, assurance of things hoped for. This definition, this archaic meaning of the word hope is the, word, the way the word hope is used all throughout Scripture. That's what they would have thought of when they penned the word hope in Greek or Hebrew. It was an assurance. It was a trust. It was a reliance in the word of God. It's not a, I hope it rains tomorrow, though I certainly don't hope that. It's been doing that too much. Or I hope I get a raise. It isn't wishful thinking. And it doesn't depend on us to wait to see what happens, as hope is defined today. Biblical hope is also not based on a feeling. It's not based on an emotion, as often is the case with our modern use of the word. Hope today elicits a feeling, it elicits emotion, it elicits a desire of something we are not sure of. But biblical hope is based on the knowledge of fact. It's a trust in God, relying on the authority of his word that provides the assurance in his promises. Does that make sense? That's how we need to think of the word hope as we read today's scripture and as we read the Bible in its entirety. I want us to be armed with that definition as we dive into this entire series because that's biblical hope. That's Christian hope. If you've been coming to Severn for a while uh, or have been tuned on lately, you know that we make an effort a strong effort every single week to preach the gospel. In every message, because the gospel of Jesus Christ changes everything, 
It changes everything. In this text, we're going to find one of the greatest ways, the most significant ways that the gospel changes the lives of people. Uh, Peter begins in this first letter by stating to his Christian readers, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. So this brings me to my first point today, and that is new birth. Being born again is a requirement for every Christian. Born again, born again. That term is, it's kind of weird in our culture. It has a connotation that's really sometimes very far from the truth, if you think about it. Many hear that phrase and they instantly think of super religious people or people who are usually pretty emotional in their expression of worship. Uh, it, it's a, it was a movement that happened in the latter 20th century, maybe. You know, people say, I'm a born-again Christian, as if it's a certain kind of a Christian. But that's not at all what God meant when he said we needed to be born again. What Peter was referring to here was something very different. He says here that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. The us there are Christians. All Christians are born again. It's a requirement to even be a Christian. It's not a kind of a Christian. It is a Christian. To further illustrate this point, I want to turn to the third chapter of the, Gospel of, of the Gospel of John. Here we meet a man named Nicodemus. Most of you have heard this, but this guy was no ordinary man. Just like Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, he was a Pharisee. And that meant he was a very learned man in his time. He knew the scriptures. In many cases, he memorized most of them by heart. He probably would have been fairly wealthy for his day, he was successful, he was educated, and he was considered in his time to be a spiritual giant because he made it life's goal to follow or at least attempt to follow every single jot and tittle of that law that he had memorized. So people would look to him as a learned man, as someone who had it all together, as someone who met all of the requirements. But he had been intently listening to the teachings of Jesus. Unlike many of his colleagues, he, he found something different in the teaching that Jesus was, was giving all throughout the land. And so one night, he approaches Jesus. Now, he didn't do it in broad daylight. I guess he just, he had to go in, in secret to, to, he didn't want to push it too far. But one night, he went to Jesus, and he didn't go as the other Pharisees and the Sadducees did. Most of them, when they approached Jesus, they were trying to trick him. They would ask him questions to trip him up to see if he would be consistent in his message. But that's not what Nicodemus did. He didn't come to trick him. He came to inquire about his teachings. Nicodemus was moved so much by these teachings and he recognized, he even said to Jesus, I recognize that God must be with you because only someone that has God with him could perform such signs and miracles. But Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Imagine how that must have hit a man like Nicodemus. Here is a man. Here Jesus is telling this righteous man that he wasn't good enough. All of his studying, all of his knowledge, everything that he had known wasn't enough. And he said, but you don't need to add anything to your faith. It is not an additional requirement that I am placing on you. He said that you basically have to start all over again. Everything you've learned, everything you studied, you need to start over again. You need to be born again. And he said, you need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born of the Spirit and of water. If Nicodemus 
this giant in the faith had to be born again, if he had to start all over with the basis of Jesus, then every Christian has to be born again. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. But, but let me stop here. I want to be very careful that I don't misrepresent this. While it is a requirement for every Christian, Peter assures us in that same verse, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He causes it. It is not something that we can do. It's not something we have to earn to measure up to achieve this requirement. He has caused us to be born again. While our mothers may have risked their lives to bring us into the world, Jesus gave his life that we may be born again into the newness of a life that only Jesus can provide. There is absolutely nothing you or I can do to earn our salvation. You must get that clear. There is just no way that we could possibly meet any of the requirements of the law, let alone the requirement to be born again. It is God who has caused us to be born again, but there is good news. There is good news. Whether you're a religious giant like Nicodemus or just an average person like most of us, Jesus paid the price for our salvation on the cross. And he offers this requirement of new life as a free gift. It's a free gift. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to live up to it. It's a free gift. All we need to do is believe in the promises of Jesus Christ. So after we accept the fact that being born again is a requirement. And Jesus made this meeting of the requirement possible by belief in him. We need to get a hold of just what it is that we are born again into. I know that sounds terrible, ending a sentence with a preposition, but I don't know how else to say it. We are born again into something. If you're here today and you're not, you've not turned your life over to Jesus, let me tell tell you what you would be turning your life over to. It brings me to my second point. We are born again, the Bible says, into a living hope, an assurance of our eternal destiny. Born again into a living hope, an assurance, church, do you hear that word? Assurance of an eternal destiny. We don't have to wonder what happens when we close our eyes for the last time. We don't have to worry and ponder if we got it right. We don't have to wonder if the scales at the end are tipped one way or the other. Our assurance has been bought by Jesus Christ. With our biblical definition of hope in hand, we can see that we've been born again into an assurance. It's a promise. It's a commitment made by God himself that we're going to spend eternity with him because of that finished work of Jesus, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. These scriptures are rich and they're they're so great to ponder, so great to meditate. If ever you want to try meditation, go to this passage of scripture. It is full of, of truth about what God has done for us and what is waiting for those who put their faith in Jesus. We too, and all who put their faith in Jesus, will be resurrected just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus says, do you realize that, church, that someday, in the end, we will be resurrected, we will be given new bodies, and those new bodies will exist in a, some kind of physical uh, existence, but it will be, our bodies will be imperishable. They'll be undefiled, and they will be unfading. There will be no more tears, and no more pain, and no more sickness, and no more death, and no more of the things that be that befall us in this life. And we will live in a paradise that has been restored after the fall. The paradise that was lost back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve decided of, of 
God had given Adam and Eve everything. He desired to walk with them in the cool of the evening, to commune with his creation. He didn't create Adam and Eve and all of us because he needed us. He created us because he wanted us. He wanted a relationship with us. And he just had one little rule. Don't eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it wasn't about an apple. Because God knew if his creation knew of good and evil, that they would die spiritually. He told them that they would. But it wasn't good enough for man. Man had to be like God. They had to have everything. And from that moment on, the paradise that God had built, man was stricken from it. And he spent the rest of the 66 books of the Bible laying out the plan of salvation, the only way that paradise lost can be paradise restored. While we're still here on earth, though, that's great to look forward to where we will be in the end. But when we're still on this earth, this new hope, this new hope can transform your life here and now. We don't have to live in our circumstances. It can transform. Everything about your life can be completely affected by the assurance of your future. Think about that. Think about that. Your whole attitude about just about anything that you do is affected by your belief of the future state. If you believe that there is nothing, if you believe when we take our last breath, we die, we rot in the ground, and it's over, like many schools teach, then your, your attitude for the future is going to be shaped by that belief. You will be very doing things that are very much centered on today and centered on me and getting all that I can while I can for eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But if your, your understanding of the future is based on an eternal understanding that as a child of God we're going to live forever, then your whole attitude in this life will be that of preparation for that time. It will be an excitement to share the faith that God has given us to people who don't know the truth because they too can be in paradise forever. Do you see that? How you think about the future shapes everything that we do today. Some of us place our hope in a satisfaction that would come from things like money or possessions. You know, just, just one more raise. Just, just a little bigger house. If I just had a few more of the, of the right kind of friends, then I would be happy. Typically, those things only disappoint to find out that just one more is never just enough. Am I speaking to the right crowd? It's never enough to completely satisfy if that's all you have, your hope, your assurance in. Recently, uh, we watched a, a film um, called The Ultimate Life. If you've seen it, it's all about this Texas oil tycoon. He's a multi-billionaire. And he went through life achieving this, and he lost his family doing it all. But as he was approaching death, he recorded 12 tasks for his grandson to do. He called them gifts because he tried to instill in his grandson in death what he failed to do in life. And as his grandson went through these things with this unbelievable haughty attitude, his life was changed forever into understanding what life was all about. Now, the film doesn't go to, to preach the gospel. I wish it did, but... But there's a sequel to that film that's just come out called The Ultimate Life. And The Ultimate Life is about Rhett Stevens' life before the first movie. Basically, it starts him as a very small child, very poor surroundings, very meager, humble beginnings. But he decided very early on that he was going to be a billionaire. And he was going to stop at nothing to become a billionaire. Well, you know from the other story that that actually happens. He does become a billionaire, but everything he did was driven by this belief that being a billionaire would be the source of all of his happiness. As he approaches this goal, 
as he gets right to the edge, he needs one more thing. He needs this oil refinery to make himself the rich man that he wants to be. And this, this poor guy has it, and he's really down on his luck, and he really needs to sell it, and Rhett really needs to buy it. But he needs to close this deal on Christmas, Christmas Eve. He leaves his three kids, his wife, and he says, I'll be home. I'll settle this deal in no time. He flies somewhere to go settle this deal. And he talks to the man, and the man says, I'm not ready to make this deal. He, he, he gets all frustrated, and I, you've got to make this deal, and I'm going to take this over, and on and on and on. And so he goes away, he says, I need time to think about this. So Rhett sits there through the night before Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, all alone in a hotel room in a strange city. And the day after Christmas, the guy knocks on the door and hands him the signed papers. And Rhett said, well, if you were going to sell it to me, why did you wait till the day after Christmas to sell it to me, to sign the papers? And he said, because I knew that I could. He knew that attaining that thing was, the, was all that this guy wanted, and no matter how long he had to wait, even if he cost him his Christmas with his family, that he was going to do it. He opens the paper the next day and he sees, Rhett Stevens is a billionaire. He's all alone. He closes the paper and he says, it just doesn't feel like I thought it was going to feel. Some people put their satisfaction and hope and money and possessions, but it never satisfies. It never satisfies. Others, they, they hope for the perfect relationship, the perfect wife, the perfect husband, the perfect kids who will achieve in life what we never could achieve. How many parents do that to their kids? Oh, I never did that, but I'm going to make sure that my kids do it so they can live my life. I can live my life through them. But we often find out that even people, even people easily disappoint us. Placing our hope in Jesus is the only thing, the only thing that can assure ultimate satisfaction. So, We've seen that being born again is an entrance criteria for a Christian and that the Christian born, is born again into a living hope that we will spend eternity with him. So as believers, as believers who've been born again into this living hope, what can we expect to experience while we're here on this side of eternity? What does the Bible promise? Well, my third and final point is growth always follows new birth. Verses six through nine say, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Church, birth is always followed by growth until the day we die. It's just a matter of measure. Growth always follows birth. Those of you who are mothers know that as painful as it is to give birth to a child, my wife tells me that it's really the easiest part of the child rearing process, right? You know, your kids start off from the infants and the diapers and the car seats and the carriers, and then they become toddlers and they hit the terrible two stage when you think, who is this human being that's invaded my home? And then before you know it, you're sending them off to to preschool and kindergarten and, and elementary school and just when you think you've got the school thing down, you wake up and there's teenagers in your house. Now what am I supposed to do with these kids? I don't, I mean teenagers and high school and all that comes with hormones and so on and so forth. Not that that ever happened in my house. No, of course it did. And just when you think you've got that whole thing down, you're sending them off to college. Or maybe you're sending them off to trade school or they're going off to work or maybe they're even getting married. And you blink and it's over. Let me tell you, you blink and it's over, but it's all a process of growth. 
It's a continuum. And just as our mortal life is a continuum of growth from one stage to another, when we were reborn, we begin a continuum of growth as a Christian. As Peter warns us, though, this growth doesn't always come without trials and without pain. As a matter of fact, the Bible guarantees that we're going to have trials and pain. Jesus himself said at the end of the Gospel of John, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome this world. And in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul's us, Paul tells us that we should rejoice in our sufferings. That's kind of hard to hear because he says knowing that suffering is going to produce endurance. How many of you know an athlete, a real athlete, who hasn't had to suffer to beat his body or her body into submission to achieve what he's trying to do? And it says endurance, it produces character. Someone who gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning every single morning, seven days a week, you build some character, and character produces hope biblical hope and assurance and that hope does not put us to shame because it is an assurance in God because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us I'd like to call the worship team up you know if if your deepest hope If your deepest hope is rooted in the circumstances of life, then when those circumstances go poorly, you'll be left very disappointed. And in many cases, you'll be left without hope. But if your hope is deeply rooted in the finished work of Jesus, if it's rooted in the promises that only he can make, then, then, when your circumstances go south, when, when your bank account is overdrawn because you've spent too much but your bills still need to be paid, when sickness and death invade your life, all that does, the Bible tells us, is drive us further into your great hope. It's the same way fire refines gold. It doesn't destroy the gold it destroys everything else and leaves the gold pure. It purifies it. I know. I know that many of you are facing things even today that I can't even begin to imagine. Things that seem impossible to overcome. There's hurt. There's pain beyond your ability to bear it. I know that's part of this church. I know it's part of every church. It's part of human life. It leaves you weary. It leaves you scared. It leaves you overwhelmed. But I'm here to tell you that if you are a Christian, if you have put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, if you've been born again into a living hope and assurance based on the word of God, then you are not defined by your circumstances, though they are very real and they can be very debilitating. If you put your trust and hope in Jesus, you can rest assured, you can be confident that no matter how bad your circumstances are, our ultimate peace is found and it's secure in the living hope that Jesus Christ provides. A biblical hope that provides assurance, a trust in the word of God, because he said so, because he is God. An ultimate peace that is secure in a living hope to an inheritance that is imperishable. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine your inheritance. It's imperishable. It's undefiled, and it's unfading. And Peter tells us here that it's kept in heaven just for you. Now that's, that's, my friends, is an assurance worth hoping for. Amen? Amen.